For hundreds of years, the piano has been hailed as one of the most expressive instruments, capable of producing beautiful melodies that stir the soul and ignite the imagination. From the delicate compositions of Chopin to the powerful symphonies of Beethoven, the piano has been the vessel through which countless masterpieces have been brought to life. But on one terrible day in Hiratsuka, the beautiful sounds of the instrument brought nothing but sorrow. This is the true, solved story of Matsuzo Ohama and the piano noise incident. This video is going to be one of my darker ones, so consider this your warning. It also takes a lot of information from a book which is written in a way that shows how much the perpetrator was feeling, so the style of this video may be a little different and slow burning than usual. Still, Still I hope you find it informative. If you're a returning viewer or someone new to the channel, welcome. I make videos on Japanese cases, strange, solved and unsolved. If that sounds like something you think you'll find interesting, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. In any case, let's get on with the video. Matsuzo Ohama, born on the 4th of June 1928 in Tokyo, Japan, was the second son among six children, three boys and three girls. The family operated a bookstore in Kameido Cho, but heavy debts meant his parents had to work tirelessly to make ends meet, leaving little time for nurturing or discipline for their children. Despite the challenges, Matsuzo showed promise as a bright and lively student, and was even top of his class in elementary school. However, at the age of 10 in 1938, he began playing with a neighborhood child who had a stammer. In a tragic turn, Matsuzo began mimicking this speech impediment, which caused him to withdraw from his once vibrant self, becoming silent and introverted. Upon entering junior high school, Matsuzo faced a daunting challenge during his Japanese language class, reading a book out loud in front of his classmates. Regrettably, this experience turned into a humiliating and traumatic event for him. Struggling with hiragana characters, he became the target of ridicule from his peers. This ordeal left Matsuzo with a profound sense of inferiority, shattering his motivation to excel academically. Consequently, his grades plummeted, and he found himself retreating further into isolation. Following his graduation from junior high school in March 1945, Matsuzo and his family faced the grim realities of war. Evacuated to Yamanashi Prefecture amidst Tokyo's devastation, Matsuzo found employment in a munitions plant and later in a train factory. However, it was during this time that his speech impediment worsened significantly, often accompanied by sudden outbursts of anger. It is said he frequently clashed with his older brother, which exacerbated his isolation from both family and community, as they shunned him. As tensions mounted, Matsuzo found himself drifting further away from any semblance of familial or social interaction. In May 1947, Matsuzo secured a position as a station employee at Kunitachi train station with Japanese National Railways. Having an IQ of 109, slightly above average for the time, he was regarded as intelligent and diligent by his fellow workers. His promising start took a drastic turn as he became entangled in a world of keirin or cycle racing, so he squandered his wages on gambling, resorting to misappropriating funds from ticket sales at work to fuel his habit. Matsuzo's descent into financial ruin accelerated. By September 1950, he ran away with nearly 40,000 yen to Mukojima, where he wasted away his ill-gotten gains on women. Following a month of reckless spending, Matsuzo found himself destitute and desperate. In October of the same year, he attempted to pill for 2,000 yen from a train station commuter pass booth. His actions led to a summary court sentencing him to a year in jail with an additional three months suspended sentence, naturally resulting in the loss of his job at the train station. Upon his release, Matsuzo struggled to find stability, bouncing between various jobs in Tokyo and Kanazawa. Eventually, in 1951, he returned to the family home in Yamanashi, where he sought employment in farming and as a lathe operator. Perhaps from lacking direction or motive, Matsuzo's work ethic deteriorated rapidly, earning him a reputation as being a lazy and ineffective employee. By 1953, his lackluster performance had alienated both colleagues and family members, drawing sharp criticism from his older brother. Upon hearing his older brother's complaints, Matsuzo was quoted as saying, If I stay at home, I will be in trouble. Faced with mounting disapproval and a sense of impending anguish, Matsuzo made the drastic decision to flee to Shimbashi, where he lived on the streets as a homeless individual. 
During this time, the stress and anxiety of his circumstances manifested into debilitating headaches, adding to his distress. In 1956, Matsuzo returned to Kamiidecho, the neighborhood of his family's pre-war residence. Resuming his role as a lathe operator, he found himself once again caught up in a cycle of job hopping, reminiscent of his past experiences. His persistent speech impediment remained a significant hurdle in his professional life, often frustrating his superiors to the point of causing them to refute to provide necessary guidance or even talk to him. Matsuzo's confidence waned, and his motivation to excel dwindled, further perpetuating his struggles in the workplace. Despite his criminal history and evident disinterest in work, Matsuzo married into a farming family in May 1959. However, the relationship with his wife quickly soured when it was discovered that she had secretly resumed contact with her former husband. The strain of the situation proved insurmountable, leading to their divorce in April of the following year. By November 1960, their separation was finalized, and Matsuzo received a sum of 30,000 yen as part of the settlement. When divorce is caused by sudden actions of one of the spouses in Japan, they often pay a fee like this. Between 1959 and 1963, Matsuzo lived in an apartment located in Namikicho, Hachioji. Occupied predominantly by young families and their children, the atmosphere was vibrant and bustling. However, Matsuzo's presence in the building was marked by his noticeable aloofness and cold interactions. He seldom greeted his neighbors or engaged in any form of conversation, fostering an impression of oddness and moodiness amongst the other tenants. From around 1963, Matsuzo began working two demanding shifts at a Hino Motors factory. Frequently assigned to the night shift, his routine involved sleeping from the early hours of the morning through the afternoon. However, his unconventional sleep pattern drew attention when a neighbor lodged a complaint about the noises emanating from Matsuo's stereo during the early morning hours. He liked to play his stereo after he returned home from work or on his days off, which honestly resulted in an overly harsh complaint from the wife of the couple living next door. Matsuzo was utterly shocked by the complaint and completely stopped playing his stereo altogether. Strangely, this incident triggered an unusual and unsettling response in him, heightening his sense to sound. Not only did he become conscious of the sounds that he himself made, but he also became hypersensitive to the sounds of others. Given the thin walls typical of Japanese apartments, especially those of the past, noise easily penetrated into other rooms, exacerbating Matsuzo's fixation on sound. With numerous children residing in the building, their natural laughter and playfulness began to agitate him. Matsuzo's demeanor shifted, becoming increasingly confrontational with his neighbors, often reprimanding the children for their noise and even reacted angrily to minor disturbances like the opening of windows or sliding glass doors. In a distressing escalation, Matsuzo resorted to extreme measures, tragically taking the lives of three neighborhood dogs that barked during the night. Understandably, authorities were alerted to these actions and he was rightfully punished. It became apparent that a significant transformation occurred in Matsuzo during this year, 1963. He began hearing unexplained loud noises while attempting to sleep during the afternoon, leading to prolonged periods of sleep deprivation. Convinced that his neighbor was intentionally causing these disturbances in retaliation for the dispute about his stereo and Matsuzo's complaints about the children and dogs, his paranoia intensified. In July 1964, Matsuzo decided to leave his current apartment and sought a change in employment. Despite the potential of a fresh start, the hypersensitivity to sound that had taken a hold of him persisted. Although his new living environment offered a semblance of peace, his heightened sensitivity to noise only intensified. Taking extreme measures to mitigate any potential disturbances, Matsuzo resorted to unconventional methods. He lined the floors of his kitchen and dining room with mattresses to muffle any footsteps, and he made a concerted effort to tread softly. Even during routine activities like bathing, Matsuzo was meticulous, ensuring that water dripped from his body in a manner that wouldn't produce splashing sounds. Even dripping water while bathing was enough to agitate him. Upon relocating to Kanazawa, Matsuzo found employment at an ironworks managed by his relatives, a seemingly promising opportunity. 
Fortunately, he no longer had to endure the demanding night shifts, but a newfound sensitivity to the chirping of tree sparrows plagued his mornings, often causing him to begin his day with rage. As usual, Matsuzo resorted to drastic measures and climbed nearby trees to cover them with plastic tape in an attempt to deter the birds from roosting. In April 1965, an acquaintance introduced Matsuzo to a woman named Tomiko, marking his second marriage. Despite his wife's lively personality, Matsuzo remained unchanged, prone to outbursts of anger and moodiness. Shortly after their union, he resorted to physical violence, striking his wife over trivial matters, especially when she made noise, prompting thoughts of divorce on her part. Inevitably, Matsuzo's instability and odd traits spilled over into his professional life yet again, leading to his ultimate resignation from the ironworks. Adrift and directionless, he whiled away his days in his apartment, emblematic of his ongoing struggles in maintaining steady employment. Two years later in 1967, Matsuzo and his wife returned to Hachioji, where they took up residence in a company dormitory. Matsuzo assumed the role of a boiler man, while his wife was employed to manage the dormitory. However, despite the semblance of stability, Matsuzo's tendencies towards anger and intolerance over noise persisted. He became increasingly irate with fellow tenants who would speak during the night, leading to heated quarrels and tensions. These conflicts ultimately culminated in Matsuzo resigning from his position and relocating once more in search of a more harmonious environment. From May 1969 to July 1970, Matsuzo worked at Komatsu Limited Construction Company. True to form, he remained quiet and reserved during his tenure, leading little impression. In April 1970, amidst his employment, Matsuzo once again moved, this time settling in an apartment complex in Hiratsuka, Kanazawa, occupying apartment 406 on the 4th floor of the 34th building alongside his wife. Matsuzo once again began his characteristic fixation on sound. It was here when, while watching television, Matsuzo adopted a stringent habit of using headphones to contain sound leakage and isolate himself from any extraneous noise. Additionally, he became notorious among fellow tenants for his incessant complaints about their so-called disturbances. He was both extremely concerned about making noise himself and hearing the noise of others. Other people in the apartment building would avoid him, and whenever Matsuzo encountered others, they would not greet him, and would even turn their faces away from him. Like almost all the previous places he lived at, he was shunned. However, in June 1970, just two months after Matsuzo and his wife settled into the new apartment, another family moved in. This young family, presumably eager to begin a fresh chapter in a new residence, would tragically encounter a horrible fate. The Okumura family consisted of 37-year-old Tarashi, 33-year-old Yaeko, 8-year-old Mayumi, and 4-year-old Yoko. Unfortunately, as is often the case with these videos, little information exists about them beyond their names and ages, though it's been suggested that they shared a close and loving bond. Upon their arrival at the 34th apartment building, they settled in room 306 on the 3rd floor, directly below Matsuzo. Tarashi, a strong and handy individual with a love of DIY projects, wasted no time in putting his skills to use. On the very same day of their move, the sound of his hammering reverberated through the building as he constructed shelves and assembled furniture with his tools. However, the noise proved unbearable for Matsuzo, who was quickly consumed by fury. Venting his frustration, he stormed onto his balcony and bellowed down to the Okumura family, screaming, Shut up! The family felt somewhat remorseful for the noise they were making, but since they were moving in, they considered it to be unpreventable, just tried to ignore their new irate neighbor, and hoped he would calm down after they settled. In Japan, the tradition of introducing oneself to neighbors and presenting a small gift, typically something practical like a towel or washing detergent when moving into a new residence is deeply ingrained in life in the country. While this practice has waned in recent years, it is considered a sign of respect and politeness, and not doing it when you move in, especially into a permanent residence, is frowned upon as rude. 
For reasons unknown, the Okamura family neglected to adhere to this custom, at least in regards to Matsuzo and his wife Tomiko. This oversight exacerbated Matsuzo's already growing resentment towards them, leaving a sour impression. He was quoted expressing his disdain, remarking that the family lacked common sense and courtesy. As mentioned earlier, Tadashi, the father of the Okumura family, had a passion for DIY projects, which frequently involved hammering nails during his free time to make things. This noise got on Matsuzo's nerves, leading him to express his exacerbation, stating, The hammering is too much. Beyond the hammering, other noises emanating from the Okamura's family apartment began to wear on Matsuzo's patience, such as the opening and closing of doors or the sounds of playing children. Despite his mounting frustration, he refrained from directly confronting them about their disturbances except for the incident of the day of their move. It is unknown why he never did this. Matsuzo's peculiar behavior and odd quirks led to him being ostracized by fellow tenants who reportedly adopted a cold attitude towards him. While Yaiko, the mother of the Okamura family, exchanged pleasantries with other neighbors when she encountered them, she notably avoided doing the same to Matsuzo. This fueled Matsuzo's paranoia, leading him to suspect that Yaiko was spreading malicious rumors about him to the other tenants. Consequently, he harbored an ever-growing deep-seated resentment towards the Okamuras in particular. As time passed, Matsuzo's mostly one-sided animosity towards the Okamura family intensified. Despite the noises they made that irritated Matsuzo, he refrained from confronting them directly, opting instead to unleash his pent-up frustration on his unfortunate wife Tomiko. This horrible pattern of behavior towards women in his life was consistent throughout his history. According to writer Junichiro Omae, author of the book Madness, Piano Murder Incident, Matsuzo's mistreatment of his wife Tomiko extended to coercing her into undergoing procedures on two separate occasions to end her pregnancies. His rationale stemmed from some research out of West Germany which suggested that exposure to a noisy environment could lead to birth defects in infants. Matsuzo was also worried that a crying baby would agitate him furiously. While he neglected to use contraception, he had no qualms about forcing his wife to undergo such things, even though it was a result of his own careless actions. Over the years, the noises continued, and so did Matsuzo's boiling anger. Even the slightest sound, a sliding door, footsteps on the staircase, an opening window, a cough, a child's laughter, a hammer striking, and even birds chirping grated on his nerves, often resulting in outbursts directed towards his partner. This hypersensitivity to sound took a disturbing turn as Matsuzo's paranoia regarding the Okamura family intensified. Convinced that the mundane noises emanating from their apartment were deliberate acts of provocation, he descended further into a delusional belief that they were intentionally targeting him. In November 1973, the situation took a drastic turn for the worse when the Okamuras purchased a piano for their eldest daughter, Mayumi, to practice. During the early 70s, Japan experienced a surge in piano and electronic instrument purchases, particularly among parents seeking to encourage their children to pick up the hobby, as it was seen as something gifted children did. This trend extended to the apartment complex where the subject of this video lived, since it was populated by many families with young children. However, the widespread presence of pianos soon became a contentious issue, with many noise complaints plaguing urban areas. The apartment complex was no exception, prompting the neighborhood association to meet with concerned residents to establish guidelines. Although residents were urged to confine piano practice to the afternoons to mitigate disturbances, since the neighborhood association couldn't force people to comply legally or punish rule breakers, there was widespread non-compliance. The Okamura family, including Mayumi, who diligently practiced daily, occasionally breached the agreed-upon practice times, much to the frustration of sensitive neighbors like Matsuzo. His aversion to the piano was intense, often resulting in verbal outbursts directed at anyone playing the instrument, followed by subsequent mistreatment of his wife, Tomiko. A formal complaint lodged by Matsuzo and his wife prompted efforts from residents, including the Okamuras, to minimize disruptions, but over time they occasionally flouted the rules. Matsuzo's hatred towards the music from the instrument grew so intense that he would actively avoid being home whenever one was being played. 
Seeking solace, he would do other things like visit the library, fishing, or simply taking a stroll, anything to escape the noise. The situation took an alarming turn for the worse when Matazo lost his job in July 1973, leaving him both unemployed and confined to his home throughout the day. He found himself facing money problems, which were exacerbated by his inability to keep up with rent payments after exhausting his unemployment insurance benefits. Frustrated and at her wit's end with Matazor's mistreatment and inability to provide for her, his wife Tomiko sought refuge at her family home, contemplating divorcing him for good. Matazor's predicament was compounded by the resurgence of debilitating headaches which he experienced while homeless in his youth, albeit more severe this time. Adding to his hardship, he suddenly began experiencing tinnitus or ringing in the ears, a distressing condition for someone hypersensitive to noise like himself. The combination of financial strain, concern over his wife, and physical pain triggered a disturbing shift in Matsuzo's mental state. Paranoia consumed him, particularly directed towards the Okamura family. Beginning around the 1st of July, every time he walked past the entrance of the Okamura's apartment, Matsuzo would have bizarre thoughts, believing that the husband, Tadashi, would come to harm him with a knife. He suddenly and for no reason thought the family were out to get him, and that the piano noises were intentionally done to make him angry. In a disturbing escalation, Matsuzov fashioned a makeshift weapon, a spear, crafted from a knife attached to a TV antenna. Under the delusion of self-defense, believing that the extra reach would give him an edge over the muscular and strong Tadashi, his thoughts turned increasingly worrisome, contemplating harm not only towards the Okamuras but also towards others, including his former neighbor from a decade prior who he held responsible for his hypersensitivity to sound after she complained about his stereo. Driven by vengeful impulses, on the 20th of August 1973, Matsuzo purchased a 20.5cm sashimi knife from a local supermarket and attempted to confront his former neighbour after managing to find out her address, only to abandon the plan when she left hastily on her bicycle. Falsely believing that she had spotted him and was heading to the police box, he abandoned his plan to get revenge on her and instead turned his focus solely towards the Okumura family. He also purchased a sarashi, a type of white cloth, along with a business suit and a pair of cutting pliers. The sarashi was bought to wrap around a person's neck in case the sashimi knife didn't do the job, and the pliers were purchased to cut the phone lines to prevent the authorities from being notified of what he was about to do. He had a horrible plan in mind. As the days passed, Matsuzo's anger grew and grew. One day as he walked by the Okamura residence, he noticed a note fixed upon the door. The children are sleeping, so please be quiet. Despite Matsuzo believing that the Okamuras were the source of noise in the apartment building, the sight of the note enraged him. He interpreted it as a display of extreme self-centeredness, that they would have the audacity to ask other people to be quiet when he saw it as them who were making the noise. This note only served to intensify his resolve to take action against them. On the 27th of August 1974, a new tenant moved into apartment building 305, and unlike the Okamuras, she went to Matazo's home to greet him. When she did, she was taken aback by his rants about her new neighbor. He let out a lot of his pent-up anger on her, despite only just meeting a few seconds ago. He told her, Yaiko makes the children play piano to antagonize me. But it wasn't until the next day when the anger would cause Matsuzo to do something truly horrible. At 7.15am, Matsuzo was rudely awakened from his sleep by a sound. The sound of Mayumi Okumura playing the piano. Typically, she played at around 9am, making this morning's early start of nearly two hours especially grating. Adding insult to injury, Mayumi's playing lacked any semblance of melody. Instead, she aimlessly struck random keys, further aggravating Matsuzo's already frayed nerves. Matsuzo incorrectly interpreted this as a deliberate attempt to antagonize him, the final straw in a series of grievances. This marked his breaking point. With his wife absent and no other outlet for his mounting frustration, Matsuzo found himself alone, unemployed, depressed, and consumed by anger. A terrible situation. He was on the brink of taking drastic action. He got dressed, gathered up some items, including the sashimi knife, and bided his time. 
At around 9.10am, Yayako, the mother, briefly left the apartment to dispose of household rubbish since it was collection day. Meanwhile, Tadashi, her husband, had already departed for work in the early hours, so the children were left alone inside. And since Yayako only intended to be gone for a short time, she left her door unlocked, something very common in Japan. After watching Yaiko descend the apartment staircase, Matsuzo, donning his business suit, swiftly made his way to the Okamoto's apartment. He cut the phone lines at the entrance with the pliers he recently bought before stealthily entering a nearby room to the north. Inside, Mayumi was engrossed in her piano practice, standing with her back towards the doorway Matsuzo just entered through. Unaware of Matsuzo's presence, she was accompanied by Yoko, who was watching her sister play. Seizing the opportunity, Matsuzo struck without hesitation and did something completely unforgivable. After ending their lives, he covered their bodies with a large towel, took a magic marker, and wrote the following on a sliding door in the other room. You are causing me trouble, so at least say you're sorry. It's a matter of feelings. You didn't even come to greet me when you moved in. It's absurd for you to just stare at me with your stupid faces. People don't become murderers so easily, but... Matsuzo never finished his message, because as he was writing it, someone else entered the apartment. The mother, Yaiko. She called the names of Mayumi and Yoko after switching on the washing machine, but of course no response came. Worried, she went to enter the room where the piano and her daughters were, but Matsuzo sprung out into the living room, and before she had any idea what had happened prior, he sadly took her life too. Three members of a young family, gone like that. Leaving the apartment with his clothes stained red, Matsuzo proceeded to try to lock the door behind him to prevent anyone from entering and seeing what he had done. However, his suspicious appearance didn't go unnoticed by a familiar face, the neighbor who had moved in and greeted Matsuzo the day before. Aware of Matsuzo's aminosity towards the Okamuras, coupled with his unsettling demeanor and appearance, she immediately sensed that something was amiss. Matsuzo ran up the staircase and retreated to his own apartment on the fourth floor. He put the tools he had used for his heinous axe into a bag along with his suit tops, and then took his makeshift spear, fishing rod, and a rucksack before quickly fleeing the apartment on a motorcycle while the neighbor who saw him contacted the authorities. As he sped away, other neighbors caught glimpses of his hurried escape. Matsuzo rode his bike to Samokawa in Koza district, Kanazawa, and ditched it on a farm road near Miyayama Station. He got in a taxi and headed towards Chigasaki Station, where he got on a bus to Shoujo Koji Temple, where he disposed of the bag with the knife and stained clothes behind a hut on the temple road. He then stole some trousers and a worker's top from homes in the area between 10 and 10.30 a.m. As this was all happening, authorities launched an intensive investigation, diligently trying to work out where Matsuzo was. Interviews with friends, family, and neighbors were conducted to unravel the circumstances leading up to the attack. During their inquiries, authorities unearthed a crucial detail. In the time preceding the incident, Matsuzo had confided in a friend from Hachioji, expressing a desire to die in the sea. Promptly recognizing the urgency of the situation, authorities issued a nationwide alert, spreading Matsuzo's information and details of his actions through newspapers and radio broadcasts in the hope of garnering sightings or vital information. A massive search ensued, with 200 officers dispatched to scour the coastline around Hiratsuka. Additionally, Matsuzo's family was contacted, and fortunately they fully cooperated with law enforcement in their efforts, providing information that could help discover where Matsuzo went. Matsuzo bounced around Tokyo before making his way to Yokokawa Station in Guma Prefecture, where he slept outdoors to save money and lay low. The next day, now the 30th of August, he moved around Tokyo, where he stole another worker's top from a home early in the morning, before heading back to Kanagawa and sleeping in a parked car that was left open. He kept on the move to avoid staying in one location and risk being recognized. He was, however, beginning to give up. He had thought about ending things in the sea like he said, but in the end, he couldn't go through with it. And so, at around 15 minutes past midnight on the 31st of August, Matsuzo fortunately turned himself in at a Hiratsuka police station. Luckily, no one else was harmed by his actions. Better still, he was very forthcoming, confessing to all the events we had previously discussed, and leading police to the knife and abandoned motorbike. 
He explained how the trouble started more than 10 years ago, and that he'd been suffering mentally for a long time as a result of his acute sensitivity to sound. He truly believed that the sounds people were making were an intentional act to torment him, even though many of those sounds were just everyday noises like opening doors or closing windows. The Oklahoma District Court indicted Matsuzov for murder, as well as theft for the clothes he stole while on the run. As for his motives for the incident, he said under questioning, I flew into a rage. I thought Tadashi would attack me, so I did this to protect myself. Surprisingly, despite all the anger he previously displayed, he did seem to show remorse for his victims and apologised at the beginning. A psychiatric evaluation was conducted by authorities, and while they recognised that he suffered mentally, they did not recognise that he had diminished capacity during the crime, and was therefore responsible for his actions and able to stand trial. As he had taken the lives of three people in awful actions, of which two were children, Matsuzo Ohama's recommended sentence was the most severe, the death penalty. During the fourth public hearing on the 24th of February 1975, the leader of the Public Nuisance Committee for Hiratsuka City made an appearance. He and some members of the authorities conducted some experiments in September the previous year to determine whether the noise released by the Okamuras really was as terrible as Matsuzo claimed it to be. They played the piano in the Okamuras apartment and measured it in Matsuzo's apartment. At around 2pm, the sound was measured at 44 fonts, but the sound was drowned out by the laughter and playing of children outside. They tried again at 7pm, and even when the windows were open in both apartments, the maximum sound heard was again 44 fonts. However, since it was an experiment carried out by the police for only 15 minutes, it was considered to be unfair evidence, and didn't focus on what the court thought was the main issue, and that was how sound could affect one's mental well-being. Further doctors and professionals in the mental health field came forward in the fifth public hearing on the 14th of April 1975 to claim that Matsuzo had legal competency but was of unsound mind. Matsuzo's lawyers tried to use this unsound mind aspect to reduce the sentence from the most severe, but during the sixth public hearing on the 2nd of June 1975, Tarashi Okamura and Yaiko's brother came to testify and ask for the death penalty. However, something very unexpected happened in the 7th hearing on the 12th of May. Yoshiko Sano, the representative of an organization called the Noise Victims Society, came forward to give evidence on behalf of Matsuzo. She's quoted as saying, While the incident was very unfortunate, many people sympathized with Matsuzo at a meeting we held, and so they wrote a petition with nearly a hundred signatures, which was asking for a reduced sentence. They also brought along Matsuzo's wife, Tomiko, who had divorced him since the incident. Surprisingly, she actually defended her for former husband, despite his treatment of her, and said, Matsuzo had an abnormal sensitivity to sound, but even I thought the piano noises went too far. But during the 8th public hearing on the 2nd of June 1975, Matsuzo changed his tune completely, and while he had apologised in the beginning as I previously stated, he now said his true feelings, and they were the opposite of what he said before. He is quoted as saying, I did this because I wanted to be executed. I did not mean it when I said, I am sorry about the victims, and I have no regrets or remorse for my actions. He repeated the same thing in the 9th public hearing too. From 1pm on the 20th of October 1975, the final judgement began, and Matsuzo's sentence was death. Reasons for why this was the decided punishment are that Matsuzo was fit to stand trial despite his issues, and the severity of his actions which resulted in multiple victims, as well as his lack of reflection or remorse and other things we have discussed. He even went as far as to blame Yaiko, the victim, for what happened to her and her children. There was also no evidence that Yaiko intentionally tried to antagonise Matsuzo, and there was no evidence that Matsuzo had tried to tell her of his grievances. In fact, many people living in the same apartment building described Yaiko as being very friendly and social, and had no complaints about the noise she or her family was making. The occupants of room 206, who lived below the Okamuras, were interviewed to give evidence, saying, We did not find the noise uncomfortable, and so the person in the wrong was seen as Matsuzo rather than the Okamuras. Since Matsuzo wanted a severe sentence himself, he had no intentions of appealing against the decision, but his lawyers tried to get him a reduced sentence. On the 11th of May 1976, a professor from Tokyo Medical and Dental University tried to do an evaluation to prove that Matsuzo was suffering 
from paranoia, but fearing that this could reduce his sentence, Matsuzo didn't comply. Hundreds of protesters from the aforementioned Noise Victims Society also organized protests to prevent the sentence from being carried out. Eventually, the lawyers convinced Matsuzo to write the details of his troubles. He hand wrote about 80 pages, but most of it ended up being what was seen as a huge compilation of delusion and proved to be useless for convincing the court to reduce his sentence. In the end, the authorities never changed their sentence, and the petition written by the Noise Victims Society was also denied for good measure. And so, on the 16th of April 1977, his sentence was finalised for good and could no longer be appealed. The piano case was naturally quite a shocking incident in Japan. Immediately after it, Hiratsuka police received numerous calls from the public, stating how they understand the feelings of Matsuzo and feel bad for him. In an interview with the Yomiura Shimbun, the president of the Noise Victim Society, Yoshiko Sano, said, I disavow murder, but I am concerned that similar incidents will continue to happen. As people become more affluent, we must set clear rules for society so that people understand that the sound they make should only be heard within their own homes. You could say the spotlight on the piano issue worked, because manufacturers started pushing for electronic pianos that could be used with headphones around this time and thus avoid leaking sounds. The famous Yamaha Corporation also began giving advice to people about how to soundproof their homes to avoid any complaints or difficulties with neighbours. The Urban Renaissance Society also took notice and decided to increase the thickness of floorings from 12 to 15 centimeters in the hopes that it would help reduce how much sound travels between apartments. It is unclear how effective this was, however. Luckily, Matsuzo was imprisoned in the Tokyo Detention House, and there is where he remains to this day. Yes, despite being handed the death sentence for good in 1977, it still hasn't been carried out 47 years later. And since he was 46 years old at the time of the crime he had committed, as of making this video, Matsuzo is just short of 96 years old, making him the oldest death row inmate in Japan, and likely one of, if not the oldest in the entire world. There are some theories that Matsuzo's sentence was not carried out because he specifically requested and pushed for it, and therefore drawing it out would make his punishment more difficult for him. But others believe it was the result of public pressure. Surprisingly, even today, there is a lot of sympathy towards Matsuzo. In a nation renowned for its emphasis on respect, discretion, and etiquette, some individuals perceived the piano and carpentry noises emanating from the Okamura's household to be very bad manners, leading them to believe that the family somehow brought this tragic fate upon themselves. I was actually pretty surprised when reading some comments online. The most likely and prevalent theory is that once he became imprisoned, his mental well-being deteriorated, so carrying out the sentence would prove difficult on a moral level. It is unclear what happened to Tarashi, the poor father and sole survivor of the incident. I can't imagine the terrible heartache he must have felt. One day he was saying goodbye to his wife and children to go to work, only to find out later that that would be the last time and that he would never see them again. I hope he never felt guilty for what had happened and that he wasn't able to protect them. It's too sad to think about really, but I hope he was able to continue on with his life. And I also hope that, despite his issues and lack of remorse, that Matsuzo was able to recognize his awful actions and do some much needed reflection. At least this is a solved case, so he received some punishment and the family at least got a bit of closure. Thank you for watching my 44th YouTube video. If you liked it, feel free to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you wish to see more videos like this about Japan. This is one of those videos that sheds a light on Japanese society a little. Since Japanese people are very respectful and conscious of their actions, they are very mindful of the sounds they make so as not to bother others. You notice this if you ever ride on Japanese trains. Even if they are packed full of people, there is almost no sound. The group mentality mindset has made Japanese people even sympathetic towards Matsuzo, despite his terrible deeds. I suspect some of you watching may even feel pity for him a little. While we can clearly see that there were some issues, we cannot forget that Matsuzo took the lives of three people, and there is no excuse for that. We must also remember that there are children involved, and we cannot blame them. Unlike many of my videos, I am glad this has been solved and that Matsuzo has been punished, but I wonder how he is today. At 96 years old, does he think about his crimes? Does he feel remorse? Does he still feel extreme sensitivity to sound? I wonder if the headaches he was feeling around the time of his horrible deeds were signs of something within him. 
But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, that's enough from me. Until next time, goodbye. It's been a while since I did some bonus content, so I thought I'd do a few more things here. Feel free to stop watching though, the main video of Matsuzor Ohamai is over, so you won't miss anything from that story. I mentioned that this incident took place in an apartment complex, where row after row of apartment buildings stand. Well, this incident isn't the only terrible thing to happen here, and strangely, there is another story surrounding disturbances involving sound. On the 6th of November 1974, just a couple of months after Masazo's crime, 35-year-old Masako Koseki, a bar hostess who lived in apartment 814 of building 1, was getting very frustrated. The Pomeranian dog belonging to a 24-year-old unlicensed taxi driver who lived in apartment 820, known only as W, would bark all day and night, troubling her greatly. She had had enough. On this day, Masako confronted her neighbor about the dog. Can't you do something about your dog? Dogs shouldn't be allowed in the apartment complex, right? To which W replied with, Shut up, it's none of your business, before taking a swing at Masako. Masako became enraged, picked up the dog, and threw it from the 8th floor where they lived, which sadly resulted in the animal's demise. For this, Masako paid 170,000 yen in an out-of-court settlement that very same day. On that night, W had an all-night vigil for his pet dog. Until 1am, now the 7th of November, he drank away his sorrows with his 21-year-old wife at a snack bar. He told the snack bar owner how much he loved the dog over and over again. Saying this while thinking what happened fueled his desire to do something, to get revenge. When he returned to the apartment complex, his anger swelled within him. Together with his wife, W broke the window of Masako's apartment with a metal rod, and in his drunken state, stabbed Masako. Strangely, he went to the hospital together with her, and after hearing from a doctor that Masako had passed as a result of his actions, he said, I loved that dog like a child. It is the same as if she took the life of my own child. I got my revenge for the dog. Rest in peace. Even recently though, the apartment buildings have been plagued with fires and other misfortune. The specific details are unknown, but this video was taken in February 2023. But on the 3rd of October of the same year, another fire broke out in a different apartment building, the top floor of building 1. The fire was put out, and a 53-year-old man in the opposite apartment was taken to hospital for smoke inhalation. However, an unidentified body was found in the apartment that went up in flames. And after some investigation, it was determined to be the occupant, an 81-year-old woman who lived alone. Information about the incident is very scarce, but a few articles about the fire don't disclose the cause. Was it an accident, or something more sinister? I am not sure. It's terrible to think about how many awful incidents have happened in such a small area. And finally, let's take a look at the location as it appears today. Hello everyone, I'm doing a, another round of bonus content for you. Forgive me if I sound a bit more weird than usual, I'm not feeling so good, <laughs> I'm a bit sick, so I've got my, my throat's a bit bad. It's not the best time to, uh, not the best time to record a video, but I wanted to record it because I, want, I wanted to get the video out. You've been waiting for a long time and I appreciate all the patience you've been giving. So thank you very much for, for waiting. I hope the video has been worth it. As you know, I like to take you around the places um, where, where these incidents happen. And I was very surprised to learn that the apartment complex is still around to this day. So these apartment buildings are very, very old, and if you know anything about Japan, you'll know that Japan typically tears down old apartment buildings. Anything before, you know, the 70s usually goes, and the reason for that is, well, because naturally, uh, when people want to live somewhere, they want to live in a new environment, they want to live in uh, a new apartment, but also, you know, there's so many things about Japan, like Japanese society, for example, Japan has a lot of earthquakes and old buildings are not built to newer standards of earthquake protection, they don't have the new um, technology or, the, or, the, or the, yeah, the, the new standards that buildings need to be built to by law. 
So people usually don't like living in them. They usually,、uh, someone will buy the apartment for the land, tear it down, and build a new apartment. So I was very surprised to see that the apartment complex is around. You will see, as you can see, that some are being torn down, but still the majority of them. Look at the, row after row of buildings is still here. So. And and what really surprised me is the buildings look the same as they did when the incident took place. I'll I'll put a picture on the screen now, maybe, and you can tell how little they've changed. They're exactly the same, and they they look pretty. Honestly, they look pretty depressing.、Um, I'm sure inside they're great apartments, but、uh, looking at them, they do look a bit grey and old.、Um, But yeah, I was very surprised to see that these buildings were still here, and I was even more surprised to learn that building number four, sorry, thirty-four, where the incident took place, is still here. Now it took place in rooms three o six and four o six, and I think it's the buildings right over there. So unfortunately, we can't actually see. Maybe if I can get the angle. Correct.、Uh, this is、uh, Matsuzo's apartment, and the one below, which is just here, just cut off from the bush, is the Okamura's apartment. And、uh, it's so.、Oh, there's someone there. <laughs> it's.、Um, it's so. It's a bit surreal, honestly, to see that the the apartments are still there, and and it looks as though. People are living in them. If I uh, usually um, I can't get a good angle, unfortunately. Usually、um, apartments like this have a bit of a stigma attached to them, and people I I, I know for a fact. Well, I mean I don't know it, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that the the rent of these the, these two apartments is. Much less than the other apartments nearby, because、um, people don't usually like to live in an apartment where people have died or build it, apartments buildings that are associated with death or or、um, a buildings that you know have had some bad thing happen to them. So yeah, chances are the the rent is much cheaper in there compared to the other buildings. But I was just very surprised to see that they're still around. These, this one does seem to have had a new coat of coat of paint compared to some of the other ones.、Oh, maybe that's not. I don't know. Maybe I'm just seeing things. But yeah, I was very surprised to see that the buildings are still here. And you know, 304 is here, and the playground is here. Now I'm not sure if this playground was existed when Matsuzo lived in the apartment, but I wonder if it played a factor in his in his um. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wonder if it played a, a factor in his、um, hatred for children playing, because they were constantly making noise here, and that, you know, exacerbated his frustration. Who knows? But、uh, yeah, that's that's where this is where it all happened, and, there, and just seems like ordinary everyday place. There, there's nothing really special about it.、Um, if we go back in time a bit more. Oh, this is rather interesting. The, the clock towers. These clock towers used to be everywhere in Japan in the past, especially in such like apartment complex buildings where a lot of workers would be. But they all, most of them have been torn down. As has this one. If I go, yeah, two thousand, two thousand fourteen is is gone now. But yeah, I was very, I, I it, it was very interesting to learn. That the apartment buildings were still here. I was very surprised about it, and it just goes on row after row and row. Yeah, I mean, this isn't. It, it's uncommon for such old apartments to be around for so long. But like having row after row of apartment is is not unusual in Japan.、Um, I, I I feel like these are a, sort of a holdover from a time where in Japan people were working at a particular company. This is this is what before Japan's bubble burst. So. You just wanted as many workers in one area as possible. They'd all work at the same place. I wonder if that's the case here, because the area where it is does have a lot of companies, or, or especially did during the boom. 
uh, Japan's economic boom of the you know 60s and 70s. But yeah, yeah, people they're they're slowly being pulled down. Um, so that that's uh, I wonder if one of these buildings actually is one of the ones that was on fire you know in the in the first bonus content that i showed you know you saw some some of these apartments on fire and uh may, yeah maybe the fiery damage was too extensive and they they tore, tore tore down the buildings who knows um or maybe just people don't want to live in them but i mean actually no i mean looking at the the amount of cars in in, in some of the car parks uh Sorry, I know this isn't so interesting for you, but uh, I did want to sort of show you as, 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 an, as an apology for it. it took me so long to get this video out. I know a lot, a lot's going on in my life. Um, yeah, yeah, like you know, a lot of there are a lot of cars about, and so maybe, and it does look like everyone's living in these places. So maybe they're not as unpopular as I think. They're probably just cheap apartments to live in. Uh, maybe it could even be secondary apartments, or, or I, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> I know this is really boring, I do apologize, but um, I hope that you're, you know, can find some, some uh, <laughs> enjoyment from seeing the place as it is. I will do try and do more of this if I can, but uh, it's just the bad timing with, with how my voice is right now. Anyway, I don't really have much else to show you of it. I just wanted to show you 334 where it happened. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, I'm very sorry it took so long to make. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.